All right, y'all. Podcast Sean told me that I should probably do a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode because today we are talking about minimalist diets. We brought in a vegan, a carnivore, and an omnivore medical doctor to talk about those diets, but I am not a doctor, so please do not take any of the information you're about to hear as medical advice. But I do hope you really enjoy this episode about minimalist diets. The Minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. Ryan Nicodemus is out on assignment today. He's taking care of his grandma down in Florida. So I've got some special guests in the studio with me today. Today, we're going to talk about simple diets. We're going to talk about optimal health. We're going to talk about strategies for healing. We're going to talk about the gut microbiome. We're going to talk about all my health problems. And we're going to talk... uh, Well, we're going to answer your questions with today's guests, some of my favorite people in the world and some new favorite people to me as well. We have a plant-based athlete here. My good friend Rich Roll is here. Thank you for being here today, Rich. So good to be here. You can find him on the Rich Roll podcast at richroll.com. We have Dr. Paul Saladino from his podcast, the Fundamental Health Podcast. You can find him at paulsaladinomd.com. Thank you for being here today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And we have Dr. Tommy Wood, one of the smartest human beings on the planet Earth. Well, at least of the the smartest human beings that I know. He's from nourishbalancethrive.com. He is one of the doctors, one of the many doctors that have been helping me with with many of my health woes, with testing and supplements and antimicrobials and, and, man, a whole litany of... uh, of uh, well we've gone down the rabbit hole and we'll go down the rabbit hole a bit more today you can find him at nourishbalancethrive.com and also the nourish balance thrive podcast all right gentlemen we're gonna have a conversation today not a debate and i find that the quickest way for us to have a conversation and get into your stories is for us to tackle some listener questions our first question today is from anna in amsterdam what reliable resources would you recommend I could read to get better informed in terms of vegan, carnivorous, and omnivore diets? Well, it's a fairly expansive question here because she, she's looking for some resources, and I'm sure we can get to that. But basically, I am here with a, a vegan, a carnivore, and an omnivore. <laughs> and I don't know what I am anymore. It sounds like the start to a really bad joke. <laughs> I know, yeah. right? So... um Here's the thing, though. I, I, the three of you thrive on three, I don't want to say radically different diets, but certainly three different philosophies, ideologies. And so I think it's a, a good place to start. What led each of you to well, to the diet or lifestyle you're on? Let's start with Rich. Well, I've been eating plant-based for about 12 years at this point. I'm 52. Uh, When I was 40, I was about 50 pounds overweight, and I was subsisting on basically the standard American diet, leaning towards a lot of fast food, (laughs) a lot of of takeout, uh, a lot of lack of self-care, and I had a bit of a health scare late one evening. Heart disease runs in my family, and that compelled me to take stock of how I was living, and that kind of catalyzed me into uh, a search for how to better take care of myself that kind of culminated or led me into the plant-based lifestyle, which uh, really rejuvenated me, revitalized me, got me interested in fitness, and kind of restored my vitality, Uh, and it's been kind of a progressive evolution ever since. Dr. Paul Saladino, you, uh, you... It's funny, I, I see a lot of people, and Tommy, you can probably attest to this as well, a, a lot of the times when I see people move toward a carnivorous diet, it's because they have a lot of problems, whether it's autoimmune issues, um, it, it uh, digestion or gut microbiome issues, but I don't think that was the case with you. What led you to to exploring this, this diet, this lifestyle? So this... My my journey to a nose-to-tail carnivore diet really began 10 to 15 years ago at the beginning of my medical career. I was a physician assistant. I practiced in cardiology before I went back to medical school. And, you know, I I think that I came at this from the position of a physician who's really quite interested, perhaps obsessed with understanding the roots of chronic disease and really throughout my training had disappointment after disappointment. It was just a process of continually losing my religion and being told that things would help patients, but then not seeing them help patients, whether those were pharmaceutical drugs or uh, different ways of eating that didn't actually fix things that people were having wrong with them. And so 
I think that throughout my medical journey, I've just become more and more interested in understanding what actually was at the root of illness. Mostly autoimmune is what I'm most interested in. And I think that you can make a pretty significant argument that most chronic disease is inflammatory and, and autoimmune in nature. But um, I've been so focused on understanding what was at the beginning of that and how those were getting started. And that's really led to my sort of gradual progression and discovery and sort of, well, just examination of different ways of eating, thinking that food is probably at the root of what causes illness or wellness for some people. And many years ago, I I did a raw vegan diet for eight months and experienced that. And I personally didn't have great experiences with that. I lost 25 pounds of muscle and then had some health issues and then kind of tried paleo and autoimmune paleo. And then throughout my medical career was thinking, you know, like, how am I going to help these people? Because, you know, I'm in psychiatry and practice functional medicine, and it's so hard to have people come to me who aren't getting better. And um, that really weighed on me. And so when I discovered animal-based diets and the idea of a carnivore diet, at first I thought, well, that's, that, that's kind of wild. But the more I looked into it, it's been pretty eye-opening to see the way that for a large number of people now, the exclusion of all the plant products has led to great improvements in health from an inflammatory and autoimmune nature. So, and you've been trying it out yourself too. Yeah, yeah. I've been strictly carnivore for about eight and a half months now. So no plants in eight and a half months. I know I offered you some coffee this morning. You're like, no, I can't even have coffee. And so we'll, we'll talk about that because Tommy is drinking some coffee. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's fascinating. I've talked a lot to Tommy over the last uh, several years. And I know there are times that you've told me you know, that where you look at a case by case basis and sometimes a vegan diet is the most appropriate diet for someone or removing all fiber from someone's diet is the most appropriate thing for for you know, helping them heal so um, when we when we look at this I guess more holistically you you're the omnivore of the group uh -huh. as am I I mean I just eat what's in front of me and um, what Tommy tells me to eat at this point um, so so talk to me about uh, about how, how do we how do we look at both approaches and how do we decide when uh, when either is applicable so that's that's a really good question and what i spend quite a bit of my time doing working with people either with chronic disease or um people who are trying to perform maximally in some sport work in multiple sports there's so many things you have to take into account. And one thing that I noticed from Anna's question is she wants information in terms of how she can eat better in line with her values, but I don't know what her values are. That was yeah. the same thought. That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it makes it very difficult to know where we're trying to come from from a value perspective. So that's something that she'll obviously have to to use to, to, to interpret the answers that people are giving. But in terms of the, the question that you asked, often uh, you might start with a given set of values. So um, I know, so I listened to Nimai Delgado on your podcast recently. I was speaking to, to Nimai because we have a client in common. And so, you know, one of the main things is somebody comes and says, this is the way that I want to eat. How do I get the best out of it? And that's, you know, that's one approach to take. Um, another um, scenario where plant-based diets or, you know, particularly low-fat plant-based diets have been successful is when somebody has a particular type of gut issue um, and I often think it's um, endotoxin related and one of the ways that endotoxins get into the blood and if I'm getting too technical well, too soon say, for, for, uh, you let me know for morons like me um, explain what endotoxins are so endotoxins quite simply are toxins that are in the wall of certain types of bacteria and they are in your gut in more or less proportion and uh, uh, concentrated fat is a really good way to get them into your bloodstream and they cause havoc and inflammation so i study brain injury and one of the ways that i simulate brain injury is by giving endotoxin that's one of the best ways to do it um, and then that's one scenario where you can really get a dramatic reduction in symptoms however on the other side um, there are some people who just for whatever reason can't digest fibers or there are certain aspects of plants that they really don't react well to and it sounds to me like like these uh, these people in both cases you're given there have some sort of compromised gut microbiome can you can, can you explain first off can, can you just uh, give us a high level view what what for someone who doesn't know what the gut microbiome is how would you explain that to someone it's basically the bugs that live in your gut yeah. and the the microbiome actually describes the genes of the bugs that live in your gut, whereas the uh, the bugs themselves are the microbiota, 
Mm. Uh, they're used interchangeably nowadays. Um, and yes, that's probably a big part of it. Whether that stems from the diet. So I think one thing that I'd love to hear both of these guys talk about is what uh, they can agree on in terms of maybe what humans shouldn't be eating, because I think there's a lot of agreement potentially there in terms of what these guys don't eat. Um, and that's where a lot of the problem comes from. Yeah, I think we can start by saying we all agree that whether it's vegan or a vegan diet or, or a carnivorous diet, there are non-ideal versions of these, right? There, there's the the all Oreo-based diet, uh, which is... Yeah, to be sure. I mean, I would say straight up that there's a difference between a whole food plant-based diet and a vegan diet. A vegan diet, you know, especially these days with the preponderance of, you know, amazingly delicious uh, non-animal product derivative type foods, <laughs> You can be very unhealthy on a vegan diet. Wait, you can just. I, I would just say right, right away. In terms of delicious diets, if I have to pick between these two, vegan diet wins by far, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, I think you get a few more choices. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Think, but, uh, but yeah, so I think to conflate whole food plant based with vegan can be confusing. Yeah. And I think to your question about what we can certainly all agree on here, I think is that processed foods are no bueno. And in our day and age, when you go to the grocery store, almost every single aisle uh, proliferates with processed to ultra processed foods. Everything it's only when you go to the very far side on the aisle right. that you actually get real food. And I think there's something wrong with that equation that, uh, that we really need to look at and address. Yeah, so, so where we agree is processed foods bad, right? Um, but there are also terrible versions of a, a carnivorous diet, right? Uh, you, you often see people like, well, I'm just going to eat um, charred brisket three times a day. It's probably not the most ideal in terms of nutrient density. I would totally agree with that. I think that there are, um, you know, it's funny, I think in the carnivore world, we sort of adopted the same sort of terminology. Maybe a hat tip to the vegans on this one, whole foods, animal-based diet. You know, it's like whole foods, plant-based, whole foods, animal-based. But I think I, that- I hear you using the term nose to tail Nose as well. to tail, yeah. So I think that, you know, we'll probably talk about this at some point, but I think that much of the data or some of the data that looks shady for meat is often- confounded by inclusion of processed meats and things like this. We know that added nitrates are not a good thing for people to be eating. And uh, yeah, I would agree that processed meats and, you know, sort of junk food, uh, animal-based products are not a good thing for people to be eating in general. But when I think of nose to tail, I'm thinking, you know, eating the whole animal, the most humanely raised animal, mostly, you know, grass-fed ruminants and getting all of the organs in the animal and all the pieces of the animal, even, you know, sor sources of calcium or sources of fat like bone marrow to get a full nutrient profile rather than just eating the muscle meat, which is nutritious, but is going to lack some things as well. Yeah. So tell me, wh where do you see, where do you see the problem in, in people who adopt a, uh, where do you see problems when you're, when you're dealing with people and people who, who adopt either diet? Um, what, what comes up most often? So, Again, it, it comes down to, to a couple of things. One probably being the gut and the other one being um, deficiencies or um, absences of certain nutrients. And again, there's, there's particular ways to test for this or you might just be going from symptomato symptomatology. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I found that, that both have been helpful for me. I mean, when I first came to you guys about three years ago, uh, Nourish, Balance, Thrive, we went through a whole bunch of tests that, that really illuminated a lot of problems for me it was i had heavy metal poisoning because i was a pescatarian for nine years um i had you know c diff in the gut and and I, we, we had a, a bunch of problems we were able to figure out but i think the symptoms le are what led to the testing so quite often you can you it sounds like you can sort of ascertain what the problem is based on the symptoms but the tests uh uh make it more clear yeah the more time I, I spend with people I think the the less testing I do because there's you end up with an overwhelm of information and it doesn't necessarily change what you end up doing um, but in reality I, th I think a lot of what you do can be guided by symptoms so um, I can think of two um, again two world-class athletes both have been you know in the same sport both have been world champions in their sport 
both went uh, plant-based at a similar time. One absolutely thrived on it. The other one, everything fell apart. And I couldn't even tell you, and you know, chefs prepared the best food, nutritionists told them exactly what to do and it wasn't bad advice by any stretch. And I couldn't even tell you what it was that, that caused one to, to benefit and, and the other to not. So sometimes you just have to um, iterate and figure out what it is that, that ends up w w working best for you. Yeah. Yeah, so so when I'm when I look at both, I've I've actually tried. Well, I haven't been I haven't tried a complete carnivore diet because I've had coffee and maybe some oils in my diet, and it sounds like Paul would like smack them out of my hand or something. Um, but I, I can tell you that um, when I was much like Rich, eating the standard American diet for a long period of time, uh, I was unhealthy. I was fat. I weighed 80 pounds more than I I weigh now, in my mid 20s, and I just didn't feel very good. Um, I went to a vegan diet for a year and felt appreciably better. Uh, I would say a mostly plant-based diet. You know, I, I, I'm sure I had some processed foods in there in, in my mid-20s, but I was actually eating real foods that my body wasn't used to or hadn't, hadn't experienced in a very long time, and I felt appreciably better. Uh, I eventually incorporated fish back into my diet, which led to the high levels of mercury in, in my blood um, because I also had issues with... Um, with it seems unethical to me to to kill animals although for the longest and so it's the thing i struggle with the most for the longest time we've eaten animals but i don't think that is a good enough reason to say yeah well we've always done it this way so we have to keep doing it uh the question is what is appropriate for me um as i, I started working with nourish balance thrive i i figured out that um um, my diet was, was already pretty dialed in. You all had me actually add meat back into my diet, which was really difficult for me at first because I, I, I remember going to like just getting a few cubes of steak and how awful it was the first time. But of course you, you get, you get used to it. But also I think a lot of that for me was, was psychological. And so bringing the meat back in, into my diet and over the course of a couple of years, I felt better than I ever did. Um, and then last summer, I removed essentially all fiber from, from my diet, auto, autoimmune paleo. And for the first time in my life, I removed inflammation. I didn't realize how inflamed I was until I got potatoes and rice out of my diet, basically, which for most people are health foods. They're, they're good foods. Uh, I mean, most of us don't look at like, oh my gosh, a sweet potato, that's terrible for you. Um, but when I, when I, when I all of a sudden remove those from my life, I felt so much better. And it was unbelievable, like better, more energy. My autoimmune issues went away. And then I went to Brazil last September and uh, came back with what I assume was E. coli and a bunch of other stuff. Um, it tells me that my gut was probably pretty compromised going down there in the first place. But um, for the last seven or eight months, we've been dealing we, we've been dealing with like trying to rebalance my gut at this point. So I guess what I'm saying here is I've benefited from a plant-based diet. I've benefit, benefited from a mostly carnivorous diet. And um, I think that Anna, where, where she is right now, is she's, she's asking, I'm already 90% of the way there. I'm trying to make these, these last few tweaks. What does she need to tweak at this point? I think we'd have to talk to her a little bit more in depth to know exactly what it is that needs to get tweaked. I mean, we don't know her. And like you said, you know, we don't know what her value system is. So how do we advise that person? I mean, we can all agree, like we said earlier, that she should remove the processed foods from her diet. And then after that, I think it would be a, a, a process of, you know, testing on herself in conjunction with someone like yourself who can evaluate her microbiome and her blood markers to determine, you know, what's optimal for her. I do think that, and we can get into this more if we'd like, that in the general population, in the general media, there's been an unfair sort of vilification of animal foods as well. And she kind of mentions this in this message that she's sort of overwhelmed by this, this amount of information. And I think from my perspective, one of the greatest discoveries or realizations that I've come to is that the, the demonization of animal foods is almost entirely unfounded. And I wish people would appreciate, you know, how nutrient dense these are and how, like you sort of mentioned, we've been eating them for our entire evolution as humans. 
and just incorporate that into their decisions regarding how much of them they're going to eat. Because I think that people sometimes... Now, now, let me just interrupt you there. When you say demonization, <coughs> do you mean... Because uh, I, I, I see that from two sides. One for me is like, I question the ethics of killing and eating animals. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is like, I, I hear you know Donovan Mitchell, a, a NBA basketball player, he's like, yeah, I had to stop eating red meat. And you're like... That's probably not why you were unhealthy. It might have had a lot more to do with the, the cheesecake after the meal or something, right? Yeah, and I think this is there are two issues there that we can talk about individually, but I think that to address the latter issue, I think that if we actually look at the science around the health benefits of red meat and, you know, frankly, the um, the the sort of corresponding media portrayal of red meat and animal foods as dangerous or bad for humans. When we really dig into that, what we find is that that science is not done well, it's not actually accurate, and there's no evidence that red meat is inflammatory or associated with cancers or any of these things. And so I think that I just hope people could be exposed to that sort of information too when they're considering how much of it they're going to include in their diets. I think that it's been done in a very large injustice in terms of that that aspect of its its potential health benefits. And with regard to the ethics, I think that that's a whole separate conversation, you know, around, you know, how we believe, you know, uh, our interaction with the ecosystem is. Yeah, and and I think we'll, we'll dive into that. We, we definitely have some questions about sustainability and ethics. If I may. Yes. Yeah, I just, I... <laughs> Uh, in terms of the vilification of, of animal products as food, I mean, it has to be said that animal agriculture is the second or third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Every year, we you know basically slaughter billions of animals. We slit their throats, we electrocute them. There is a massive infrastructure and system around how we treat and raise animals for food that goes unseen as a result of ag gag laws and a lot of uh, you know, well-funded lobbying interests to prevent the consumers from really understanding the process of what goes into raising these animals for our food. Uh, and I think there is a real ethical consideration there. And I just know in my own experience, look, I grew up, you know, like I said, standard American diet, roast beef, you know, the whole deal. And when I remove these products from my diet, and of course this is anecdotal and it's an end of one thing, but um, I thought, well, you know, maybe this will work, maybe it won't. And when I actually felt rejuvenated and then went on and like competed at a very high level in, you know, the world of ultra endurance, my whole world turned upside down because I had always been taught beef is what's for dinner and milk does a body good, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and to feel that good without those um, very products that I've been told my whole life were essential to be healthy and crucial if you want to perform as an athlete was really uh, an eye-opening moment. And that opened me up to the ethical considerations and the environmental considerations, which I think are very real. So if we're gonna have a conversation about this, we have to, you know, we have to at least address that aspect of it here. And I'm sure, you know, you have plenty of thoughts on that. So, so one but, thing I think we can all- But I don't know that we vilified it enough, I guess is what I would say. Okay, uh, I, I think one thing that we can agree on here is factory farming bad, right? I, mean, I think we're all saying that to start. Like none of us are, are, are saying that factory farming is a good thing. Am I, am I correct on this, Tommy? No, I think you, absolutely. Yes. Okay, I, I just make sure you weren't over there like <laughs> yeah, lobbying for big factory farming or something. Okay. Um, I would love to, Paul. I think the greenhouse gas thing, we should talk about this because I think this is really interesting and I'm not sure what sources you're quoting, Rich, but if you look the at the- World Health Organization. Well, what about the EPA and the FAO? EPA. And the FAO. So if you look at the data released by the FAO and the EPA, there it's broken down and agriculture itself in the United States represents about 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And that includes plant and animal agriculture. So we're looking at 91% of emissions, greenhouse gases in the US that are non-agricultural. The majority of that are transportation, technology, and other fossil fuel production costs. So I would just sort of respectfully disagree with the statement that animal agriculture represents the third largest production of greenhouse gases. In fact, if you look at the data from the FAO and the EPA, animal agriculture represents between three and 4% of the greenhouse gases produced in the United States. And plant agriculture is actually more than that, but 5%. plants are plants raised to feed those animals. But mm -hmm. the plant agriculture is five to 6% 
of the greenhouse gases. Well, I don't want to get too in the weeds on that. I, you know, is this Scott Pruitt's EPA? Uh, it's the FAO. So this is a non-biased yeah. United Nations committee. So there was this, unfortunately, there was a movie called Cowspiracy that was produced. And this is the Live Shacks, Live Stocks, Long Shadow. And that data was all rescinded and then recalculated. So in that movie, they talked about this large contribution of greenhouse gases from animals. And they said, oh, wait, we did the data completely wrong. They didn't look at the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for fossil fuels. And when they redid that as a non-biased organization, this FAO, they found the much more adjusted numbers. And I think worldwide uh, agriculture or ruminant agriculture is something on the order of 7 to 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's quite a small amount. If we eliminated all ruminants from the face of the earth, which would be an environmental catastrophe, we would decrease the greenhouse gas emissions in the, United, in the world by 0.39% and the United States by 2.6%. So it's essentially a non-contributory um, in terms of the greenhouse gases. Then we can get into the whole life cycle and the ecosystem and the way that ruminants can increase the carbon carrying capacity of the soil. But I think it's important to just get a sense of like the 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 adjustment that's been made to those greenhouse gas numbers for I think, I think we'll, ruminants. We'll, we'll dive more into this on, on the maximum episode. Tom, anything to reel us in here? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly bring us back to the fact that there is agreement here. And if large scale factory farming, it does contribute greenhouse gases. That is something that we should think about if you are doing grass-based, truly sustainable agriculture, you, ca uh, you can use ruminants to sequester carbon in the soil. So there is a bad way to do it, and that is what we do, and everybody agrees on that, and there is a better way to do it, which is potentially beneficial. Um, but I, I just think that in, in the bigger picture, it is a good point that I, I think when you, you want to, there is an environmental consideration, everybody wants to, or the people here want to have a minimal impact on the environment, but what you eat is actually quite a small fraction of of i took a plane down here how many cows are the equivalent of me flying down to la to to do this podcast yeah, and one seat on a coast to coast flight represents eight months of driving so we think so if you were to drive your car back and forth you know for eight months it's uh it's functionally the equivalent of having one seat on an airplane so we uh, and I, I say this as someone who flies a, a decent amount. We go out and tour and stuff. And so it is it, it is one contributing factor. It doesn't mean that factory farming isn't a contributor. And we're a not, big and we're not trying to belittle that, that, you know, that is an important consideration. Right. But, the, you know, the, it has, there's a bigger picture as well. And there are better, you know, there are bad ways to do it. And that's what we do largely. And there are better ways to do it. Well, if I can bring this back in for Anna, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Minimalism, because she talked about values. And we wrote a whole book about how to find out what your values are. And and we, we try to differentiate between the sort of foundational values and the core values, etc. And so, uh, and I'm going to send you a copy of Minimalism. If you like our podcast, you'll like the audio book version of that. Or if you want the book book or the ebook, we'll be happy to send those to you as well. Sean, if you could reach out to her, I'd appreciate it. Let's move on real quick to our lightning round. This is where Ryan and I usually answer questions from social media. We're at The Minimalists on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can follow these guys on all the appropriate social media outlets as well. We'll put all of your handles in the show notes. Our podcast, Sean, will. Our first question is from... From Corey on Patreon. Do you think most diets are created to sell books and products? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like every diet is backed by science, but that's confusing when one diet could be a vegan and, and the other could be keto or paleo. I, I think just like I, I think many of these diets have like sort of different Venn diagrams, right? And so like you could be a you can be a keto vegan, you can be a keto uh, carnivore, um, you could be a keto omnivore, right? And so like that, those are different diets or, yeah. And so there, there's a sort of Venn diagram here, but what do you think, gentlemen? Uh, oh, my, I have a pithy answer for you. Solutions are not binary in an analog world. And I think that's quite often what we're going for here is like, what is the, what's the, the yes, what do we think? What's the one thing I need to say yes to, as opposed to like, what's appropriate for me. So what do you guys think? Are most diets created to sell books and products? I don't think so. I think that behind diets are generally people that are very well intentioned and just trying to offer people solutions. I think that in this complex landscape of health and wellness and food, we're faced with a lot of choices. And I think there's a lot of voices and I think they're all super valuable. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So I don't think that people are just trying to sell 
books or meal plans, but I do think that I am sensitive to the fact that to the consumer it must look quite dizzying and yeah. hopefully, you know, we can try and sort out some of that. As a person who's written four books, I can tell you that it's pretty difficult to write a book and if you're just doing it, uh, if you're just going to make up some diet to, to write a book that, by the way, most your average book on Amazon sells fewer than one copy. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Imagine all the time you put into So it's like 0.7 copies or whatever. That means you couldn't even get your mom to buy a copy of your book. Um, a lot of work goes into to writing a book. There are probably better ways to uh, to make money than by by simply inventing a diet and writing a book about it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Writing books is hard, and it's certainly not a, a get rich quick scheme. And it it's always interesting online. We feel oh opportunistic. You're cashing in now. If you want to make a really good living, like writing books is probably not the best avenue to pursue. And you know, far be it from me to impugn anyone's you know intent when they write a book because it is difficult to do. And I would agree that that you know when somebody sits down to do that, uh, that they are well intentioned in that regard. What about you, Tommy? You got some books on the shelf? You you getting I've, ready to publish? I've uh, I think I've started writing three or four books and I've never finished it. So see, there we so, go. <laughs> <laughs> so so exactly um, what Rich is saying. I I I I know how hard it is, and just find the time to actually you know create something that's that in depth is really hard. And is that how you I'll, sell point seven books? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You sell, you sell three quarters of a book. What's I have I haven't even written point seven <laughs> books. So, um, I, I guess one thing, and again. Um, I don't know when you want to get into this, but w one thing that is common across a lot of books, A, that they're absolutely trying to help people, and I, I believe that um, the person who is selling, for, for want of a better word, a specific lifestyle has seen true benefit in their patients or their friends or whoever it is they worked with, and that could be Whole Foods plant-based, it could be carnivore, they have seen these things genuinely improve the lives of other people, including themselves. And I truly believe that. I don't think, any, you know, there is very few people who are, who are working cynically in that way. But as well as the diet, um, I would like to open up the conversation about the environment. So like, and I, by environment, I mean our personal lifestyle. I mean, sleep and stress and movement and social connection. And you'll find in every diet book that there's a chapter about that stuff, mm -hmm. because I think everybody agrees that it's super important, but you know, the diet is the one thing that makes it much easier for, for people to like, oh, I can fix my diet. You know, that's the thing that everybody wants to get excited about and change. But I believe that much bigger um, or uh, improvements can come by fixing all of that other stuff. And right, I think and they, that's common across books. And they all influence each other too. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you that as I've changed my diet for good or bad, it is has affected other areas of, of my life, whether it's sleep, whether it's my ability to exercise, et cetera. And so... It sounds like Rich, you, you you've gotten amazing benefits uh, athletically from from going to a, a plant based diet. I mean, yeah, I have. You know, I, if I could just you know respond to that a little bit. I mean, I think that human beings are reductive. The scientific method is reductive, and there's an inherent pressure within publishing to be reductive. What is your hook? What's the new thing that you're trying to pitch here? Yeah, and we all want as the audience to discover that thing that is gonna fix us, right? What is that one thing? If I just do that, I'm gonna be okay. And as I think we can all agree, we are holistic creatures and it's very complicated. So one diet might work for me, is not gonna work for you. And if you're eating the most pristine diet of all time, but you, know, you can't get along with your spouse and uh, you're depressed or you have some other kind of condition or issue or you're psychologically imbalanced and you're not sleeping at night or you're working all the time, you're not a healthy person, right? So we have to address all of these things on all fronts. Yeah. Got one more question here from also from Patreon. Come on, Twitter. Where's all the good questions from Twitter? We got all the good questions from Patreon this week. Arlen says, on a restricted budget, like a student or someone on a low income, what would you recommend as the most important staples for good nutrition? Now, Rich, we talked about this on the last podcast we did together, um, and, and and you talked about how you know healthy eating doesn't have to be you know the thirty five dollar smoothie from Air One. Yeah, I mean, particularly plant based diets get confused with elitism because of places like Erwan and Whole Foods, and it's very easy to spend a tremendous amount of money on healthy foods, whether it's carnivore or plant based. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Certainly, 
um, eating whole food plant-based can be extremely cost-effective. I mean, it's essentially pauper food. I mean, I know you don't eat potatoes, but you can buy a sack of potatoes and a big bag of rice, and you can buy fresh produce locally from farmer's markets or whatever. There is a way to do it on a budget and keep it simple and within anybody's range. I, I want to eat potatoes, by the way. Um, what was it? Like three days ago, I had half of a sweet potato. I woke up the next morning, I felt like I sprained both of my ankles because I was so inflamed. Oxalates, my man. Uh, well, and, and well, you say I that. Fr- I have a friend who ate nothing but potatoes for an entire year. Right, right, right. resolved all of his gut issues uh-huh. and all well, of his if, problems. If, he lost it, all his weight and he feel, felt amazing. I, I agree. And, and, so. and if Nicodemus was here, he could eat a bag of nails every day and he would be fine. Uh, I think it would help his gut. Um, you say oxalates, but um, white rice is even worse for me. So if I if I have some white rice, and it's this is a relatively new phenomenon for me, um, although it's not that new. Once I realized that You're I a hard I, case, I know, man. I know, I am. But th- th- that's the reason I want to bring all you guys in here because there are some people out there. I mean, Tommy can tell you this, or Chris. We have a, a studio audience of one uh, <laughs> today. Uh, Christopher Kelly is here from NourishBalanceThrive.com as well. Um, Last time you guys were on on the podcast, there were a lot of people who came to you and said, "Hey, I'm also, uh, I'm I'm struggling." And, and yes, I might be an edge case, but there are more and more and more and more edge cases now than than ever before, right? So, um, actually, Paul, you want to talk about that? You want to talk about some of the these edge cases? I'm sure you you deal with. Well, should I respond to that question about how to do the carnivore diet or on how to do budget? Yeah, yeah, because I think it's an interesting point, and it kind of segues into the nose to tail thing as well. This idea that like, you know. Muscle meat is what we've always prioritized in the West, but the organs of the animal have really unique beneficial things. And I was talking to someone yesterday and they were saying, you know, basically if you walk into a butcher shop, they're throwing organs at you. They'll essentially give you organ meat from an animal, whether it's a liver or a spleen or a pancreas. And this offends our delicate, you know, Westernized taste, but they're quite, you know, they're quite nutritious. And, uh, you know, I would ideally recommend to people if they're going to eat an, a whole foods animal based diet that they eat the organs as well and that can comprise a large part of your diet and then you can use the muscle meat to complement that. So I think if you do that and you're eating liver and you're eating sort of the trimmings of the animal, the extra fat, the collagenous tissue, you're going to get really unique nutrients there and it's quite affordable or free in some situations and you can add to that, you know, the best animal meat that you can buy when affordably. I, when I've heard you talk about nose to tail, you you mean that literally. You eat the bones, uh, uh, bone meal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I heard you talk about liver jerky, which liver is the one thing I struggle with just trying to consume. It's uh, I, I do desiccated liver pills right now, um, which is better than not doing anything, I suppose. But uh, I'll eat liver from time to time. What, what's up with this liver jerky? Well, liver jerky, you know, it's interesting. I think that if as humans, if if we don't eat liver from a young age, we don't develop the taste for it. And it's so different than what we're used to. And it tastes very irony to people. I have tons of friends who are from different cultures and they've eaten liver their whole life and they'll say it's their favorite food, but I never got liver growing up. And so the last couple of years of eating liver for me have been sort of this gradual reintroduction. And it was one of the ways that I learned that I could eat the liver sustainably or in a way that didn't make me sort of have these sort of liver trauma experiences. And since then it's gotten to be easier and I can eat, I eat raw liver now on a daily basis, but there's all these sort of like, there's all these sort of like, uh, you know, stepping stones for organ meats for people and liver jerky is one of those. Yeah. yeah. Or the, the desiccated organ tablets from, you know, companies like Ancestral Supplements are a great option too. Yeah. So, so um, when you, when we say nose to tail, how are you getting omega threes? Are you eating brains or are you doing, uh, or are you doing fish oil? I don't, so I don't like fish oil tablets because of the processing of the fish oil tablet probably results in excess oxidation and lipid peroxides. I'll do mostly salmon roe or other fish roe that's sort of wild and not, doesn't have preservatives. And then the bone marrow and the brain of the animal has omega-3 too, omega-3 as well. Um, But mostly right now it's salmon roe. And then there's, you know, plenty of DHA uh, and egg yolks as well. So all those things. The the thing that my pithy answer, and uh, I think, Tommy can back me up on this. If we deprioritize a good decision today, we'll pay for our bad decisions later with interest. And I know this from my own, my own health journey. Um, yes, we, we all have to have a budget, but I don't have the money to spend on something simply uh, when it comes to food. It means it's not the biggest priority for me. And that's totally fine. But we, we also need to acknowledge that, you know what, sometimes there is a more budget-friendly way to do it, but maybe the most bu- budget-friendly way is to go buy that bag of Cheetos and and 
that's not that that's not going to be the that's not appropriate for anyone really no <laughs> <laughs> i think that no matter what we do no matter how we choose to eat it's such a good decision when people just think about their diet intentionally and prioritize it in terms of their finances i can't think of a better investment that people can make than what they're putting in their mouth yeah and and i think we we often don't think about it that way where where it is it is an investment that ends up paying off for us in really bad ways or really good ways, depending on how we take care of ourselves. And I'm, I, at age 37, am dealing with a lot of bad things I put into my body the first 27 years of my life. And I'm, I, I'm really trying to, uh, to still fix that. So it's, uh, it's something worth considering, uh, budgeting. Tommy, how do you talk to people about budgeting when, when they come to you guys at, at Nourish Balance Thrive? Because, you know, it's, uh, uh, getting help is not always budget friendly. Yeah, so nowadays, well, it's difficult because I've spent a long time working with people who have deep pockets and a lot of means, and and hopefully in the near future I'll spend more time working with people who who don't, and I, that's where I think the biggest change needs to happen is that the average person a doesn't understand how to do this, and then B doesn't know what to do, or can't afford to shop at Whole Foods, say, or eat only ribeyes like some people might do in the carnivore 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 movement. Um, but I think both of what these guys have recommended um, work really well for somebody who's trying to go for an omnivorous approach. And potatoes are super cheap. Rice is super cheap, and that can still be good quality food. And then egg yolks, liver, sardines, they're all very nutritious and not necessarily expensive. And you can um, get a broad range of nutrients from a wide variety of um, uh, different foods. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. But um, a bit of it is overcoming some of these things that um, that we think we, you know, we're just not used to eating like small fish or liver or learning how to cook. And that's that's a that's a huge problem is that people don't know how to cook anymore. So I could buy a big bag of potatoes, but Rich, what do I do with that? All right. You know, and that 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 can for some people be really hard. Of course we could just eat raw liver, we'd have to worry about it. But um but so so it's it's stuff like that. So whatever whatever approach you take and that sort of uh, being cognizant and, and intentional with what we eat and the food we put in our mouths is the most important thing. And part of that is learning how to turn whatever food it is into something to then put into our mouths. So that cooking is incredibly important. All right, gentlemen, we have a bunch more questions here. We have questions about inflammation. I want to dive into that, about macro and micronutrients, about the gut biome, about choosing the right supplements, um, about the most sustainable diet for us and for the planet. And as I mentioned, this is sort of where I struggle, like figuring out the, the ethics behind what we eat. Uh, the need for protein on a vegan diet. Someone asked a question about that. Also, the need for fiber on a carnivorous diet. Selecting the diet that's right for you. As we talked about, all three of you have different diets. And so how do we select the diet that is appropriate for this individual? Also, uh, intermittent fasting as well as the appropriate diet for young children. I'm interested in that because Ella turns six right now and we feel like we have her diet. Uh, she's turned six this month. We, we feel like we have her diet sort of dialed in, but I'm interested to hear from y'all, especially from Rich, since you have four kids, right? I do. Okay, so we're going to get into all of that. If you want to listen to that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode, available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. You're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode, but each week Ryan and I, or I guess this week, Rich, Paul, and Tommy and I record an entirely different long-form Maximal episode over on the Minimalist Private Podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about topics we don't usually discuss in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast and keep it 100% advertisement free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll receive a personal link so that our Maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also get access to our entire back catalog of more than 100 private podcast episodes. Find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional private podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. And now here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Hi, this is Katie from outside Philadelphia. I'm calling in reference to episode I believe 176, where you talked to Colin Wright about uh, the un-American dream. And I believe it was Ryan who was saying he eventually wants to build a house that's totally off the grid. 
And I believe this information would be useful for him and any of your listeners who are interested in the same thing. There is a um organization called Earthship Biotexture and it is headquartered in Arizona, but there is sections across the United States and they specialize in building houses made out of recycled materials such as tires and plastic bottles and they are all totally off the grid and environmentally friendly. Hey guys, this is Rachel calling from Newport Beach, California. I was calling in with a tip for how to responsibly invest in purchasing a home without being tied down to a particular city. This has been a concern multiple callers have discussed recently, and I wanted to share a solution that has worked really well for my husband and I. In Southern California, many homes are at least a million dollars, which would make it really easy to get in over your head or not purchase homes using the Dave Ramsey guidelines for a sensible down payment. What we have chosen to do instead is utilize an investment company to purchase homes out of state in affordable markets that have been vetted with a reliable company. By purchasing rental properties in different states and ensuring we put down a large percentage, we have built a lot of equity and cash flow through the years. This is an excellent solution for anyone like myself who lives in an unaffordable housing market but still wants to purchase real estate responsibly. The company we've used to purchase our three properties over the past decade is Marshall Reddick Real Estate. They have been an amazing resource to us and are totally honest, offering a ton of free education and training in their website. There are also other companies out there that do the same thing. For us, this is how we have been able to invest in our family's financial future without making irrational decisions purchasing a home in an overpriced market. Instead of being a slave to a mortgage we can't justify or feeling stuck in a certain place, we personally rent and let our home ownership out of state pay for itself with tenant rent. I hope this tip helps some of your callers as it's helped us. All right, y'all. I want to say thanks again to Rich, to Tommy, to Paul. I want to encourage you to check out them and what they're doing. I want to acknowledge you guys for doing something meaningful. I think what we're trying to do here, all of us, is is help people uh, solve some problems. And so check out Rich, Rich Roll's podcast, uh, and everything else, all social media at richroll.com. You've got Paul Saladino at paulsaladinomd.com. Check out his podcast. It's uh, the foundational podcast health, I'm sorry, Fundamental Health Podcast. And uh, check out his YouTube channel as well. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's how I first got familiar with what you're doing, Paul. And then Tommy at NourishBalanceThrive.com where he helps people like me, all of us edge cases who are, are struggling. Him and Chris and their, their whole team over there. They also have the Nourish Balance Thrive Podcast. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, y'all, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Uh, the Minimalist 23 favorite coffee shops. So Ryan and I own a coffee shop down in St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, I'll give you guys some bags of coffee. Not you, though, Paul. I Can mean, I have bowls? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we just started roasting. our. Well, we've been roasting our own coffee for a while. We just started selling it online. If you want to check out The Minimalist Choice, you can do that at theminimalists.coffee. But also, um, you don't have to limit your, your bean consumption. Uh, of coffee to our beans. So we just listed our 23 favorite coffee houses around the country. You can find that out at theminimalists.com slash TMC. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And then, yeah, I've got some bags of coffee for you, gentlemen. Uh, if you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or send a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails each week. And for our added value this week, let's l- listen to a, another song from this album. It's called Good at Falling. It's a new album from the Japanese house. I know I've recommended her music before, but I just cannot get enough of this album. And, and since this conversation today is really about the confusing landscape of diet and health and, and wellness, this is a song that is sort of about confronting confusion, which hopefully we've been able to do today. Uh, the line that stands out to me on this song is, can, any, can somebody tell me what I want? Because I keep changing my mind. And I feel like, I feel like that's the thing that we, we often get into. Like when people come to you or they come to you, and say, just tell me what I want. Tell me what I need. And it's like, well, it's not, it's not binary like that. Anyway, here is We Talk All the Time from the Japanese house. And if y'all leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. The Minimalists.